Who's on first is Richard B. McCaslin. All right, he's going to be on first. You know, okay. Wait, well, I'm going to have to introduce you first. You can just stand up, get get going, get the juices flowing. Uh, most of you already know him, but when you read over his resume, just your eyes kind of roll up. And the first line you read is that he's a TSHA professor of history. Well, that's extremely prestigious. That this morning he's going to talk on the 1881 Hoods reunion, Hoods Brigade reunion of old soldiers that took place in Brenham in 1881. And this whole seminar is in honor of that. So he's going to talk about that today, and you have a handout also that you can look at in detail later that will sort of augment what he's talking about. So I'm going to turn it over to him, Rick McCaslin. I'm going to talk about a glorious time at Brenham. It's interesting that y'all mentioned statues. If you're curious, I'm from Denton, Texas. And yes, we took our Confederate statue down after three different commissions voted not to. And we took it down anyway. And what's left of it is being displayed now in the courthouse. We have a museum in our courthouse. And the top part, the soldier, which they managed to not break, is actually on a display in our courthouse. I haven't gone to see it yet. I'm not sure at all what it might be surrounded by as far as what they're saying about it. But yeah, we're going to talk about Hood's Texas Brigade. And I already told Johnny, if you look at the pictures here, they were chosen mostly because they're great pictures. They're chosen because they are photos. I like photos. But third, all the people you will see on these slides were here in 1881. They weren't still dressed like this, of course. This is them in their wartime outfits. We'll have a few pictures along the way of them in their Mufti, as we call it in 19th century photography, their civilian clothing. But the, all of these three folks, one last thing to point out, you see the number and the letter after the name, because I know people want to know those little details sometimes. That's going to be their regiment and their company. So when it says 4A, that's 4th Texas Infantry, Company A. For John Haggerty, George Robertson, and of course, the famous, who doesn't know, Valerius Giles, if you ever opened any book on which Texas Brigade, his picture is always there. Thought I would set context, we'll talk about the town, and then we'll talk about the reunion. In 1881, it was a great time to be a Confederate in Texas. I hope you're seeing a picture of John H. Reagan, Richard Koch, good, that's my test. We're going to assume that what I see is what you see. Don't tell me different, I'll cry, okay? I cry very easily these days. I'm very fragile. Both of our U.S. Senators were former members of the Confederacy. Of course, Postmaster General John H. Reagan and Senator Richard Koch. Koch was a Confederate officer as well. Our legislature is dominated by ex-Confederates. All of our six congressmen from Texas, our representatives, our ex-Confederates. Our governor is the former president of the Secession Convention of Texas and then later served as a Confederate officer in operations in the Trans-Mississippi. It was a great time to be a Confederate, unlike perhaps today. Did I say that out loud? My wife is trying to teach me to be better about that. 1881 is the year that Jeff Davis brought out his monumental two-volume work, Constitutional History of the Confederate Government subtitled, I'm right and everybody who won the war is wrong. <laughs> Good year to be a Confederate, right? So this is a time when Confederate reunions are beginning to gain in popularity. The veterans are growing older. They're beginning to gather to tell their stories, but also to make sure they're not forgotten. And there's going to be a little jostling. Who's going to be the biggest and the best, right? When we tell the stories to our grandchildren, and they read the stories in the books, who are the units that are going to be celebrated, that will be remembered and understood as being the best and the brightest among them? And Hood's Texas Brigade, for obvious reasons, it's the only unit that fought with the Army of Northern Virginia, and everybody who's ever read a history of a book on the Civil War knows that that's where the war was won and lost, right? Well, there was some stuff in Tennessee, and there's Louisiana, and yeah, all that other stuff, but... Hood's Texas Brigade is front and foremost in the theater of the war, and they want that prominence to continue, and we'll see some of that talk when we get there. This is what Brenham looked like in 1881. 
What this is is one of those Sanborn fireman maps, fire insurance maps. They made about seven or eight of them in a row beginning in the late 1870s through about the mid-1880s. They had these bird's eye views, and you could buy them. They're very pretty. This one, I kind of put a, the black and white version on here because it gives you a sharper contrast. You can actually see the building. Very highly detailed. Now, what they're for is in case your building burns down, it gives you something to give the insurance company and say, yeah, it was right there, and it looked like this. So give me money so I can build a new one. They're very popular, very useful. These are all online. If you're ever curious, go look up and see maybe ones for your hometown or the town you live in now. This one was drawn by Augustus Koch, by the way, who was one of the more famous Sanborn. But what we see in here is a growing, thriving, struggling town. Well, let's leave it here for a sec. Um, it was named for Dr. Richard Fox Brenham, who was a bit of an adventurer, even if he was a doctor. Um, he ended up being captured in the Mier expedition and then was killed in an escape attempt in February 1843. Um, allegedly, according to eyewitness accounts, he killed two guards with their own bayonets and then tripped and fell on the third guy's bayonet. <laughs> uh, I know, we're not supposed to laugh, but yeah, really? You almost made it, yeah, yeah. So one of his friends was living here in Washington County when they start platting and trying to develop. And this town was already in existence, so they renamed it in honor of Richard Brenham in 1844 when it became the county seat, which has remained for many, many years. It was incorporated in 1858, so it has a genuine mayor and a city council, etc., but the war came and interrupted progress. A lot of young men went off to the war, the economy. Sure, I'm glad to look and see that I'm just not going blind in the service of my country. Um, then after the war, things didn't get much better in many ways for poor Brenham. Uh, federal troops moved in, and in 1866, they got kind of annoyed at some of the local businesses, especially the local newspaper. So they set fire to part of the town in 1866. Um, they will not be withdrawn for another couple more years. A huge yellow fever epidemic swept through this area in 67. That's when Margaret Lee Houston passed away, by the way. And if you've ever gone over to Fanthorpe Inn, which I went to the, for the first time yesterday, both the proprietors of that, the husband and wife, passed away in the yellow fever epidemic of 67. Then another fire swept through a large portion of Brenham in 73. Um, they had a huge fire in 77. And then they decided they might better organize a local fire company, which they did in 1880. <laughs> just having the guys show up with buckets apparently just wasn't getting it. 1879, there was a widespread crop failure through this area, mostly caused by drought. So you would think that Brenham would just fade away, but it doesn't. Actually, the population of this town, despite the fires, despite the yellow fever, Despite the war, beginning in 1865, this town doubled its population every decade all the way through 1900. And that's part of the larger story of Texas. Texas will triple its population between 65 and 1900. But Brenham has a secret weapon. The reason why Brenham is surviving is it's become the junction of two major railroads. If you look at this railroad map and you leave out of Galveston down there in the bottom right-hand corner, you see that first big junction, that is not Brenham. The second big junction, that is Brenham. Brenham is the junction of the Gulf, Colorado, and Santa Fe Railroad, which ran from Galveston north to Belton. It'll go further later on. And the Houston and Texas Central Railroad, which runs from Galveston all the way through Dallas to Denison, where it links up with the Katy Railroad, the MKT. So, in Brenham, you have trains coming through north, south, east, west. Uh, according to the newspaper that year, because I checked them out, they get six passenger trains a day. And that's pretty good feed. So this is not just some little town in the middle of nowhere. This is not a town that's on the fade, though it probably by all rights should be. It's actually a growing town with easy railroad access with about 4,500 people in it at a time when that was a substantial town in Texas. Uh, we only have about six towns that are any larger. 
Who are these people? Now I'm going to try that, and that should be the map again. Uh, primarily Anglos, Scots, Irish. We're everywhere, right? We are the cockroaches of Western civilization. <laughs> we will still be here when your children are. <laughs> yes. Um, African Americans, of course, because this county was majority black on the eve of the Civil War, 52%, just a smidge, but it counts. And there's still a substantial African American population. They lived in their own section of town just east of downtown called Camp Town. So most of them are laborers. Most of them are doing what we would call blue-collar work. What's interesting is one-third of this town by 1881 is German. They started moving in after the war when that first group of settlers were aging out and putting their property up for sale. Their kids are taking it over. And so these Germans are pouring in and buying 200, 400, 600 acre plots and starting their own lives. This town is one third German. And we're going to see that a lot as we go through some of the things that are going on. This is also a town with a significant Jewish population. Now, they won't have enough Jewish people here until 1885 to organize their first synagogue. But we're only four years short of that. It is a growing Jewish population, mostly of European descent, second or third generation, by way, usually, as far as I can tell, from coastal southern towns, Savannah, New Orleans, Galveston, etc. They're moving up here. Why? Two railroads here, guys. There's all kinds of business opportunities, so they're taking advantage of that. So there'll be a, a synagogue here within four years. Kind of an international town then, isn't it? It's not just a small Anglo town out on the frontier somewhere. All these people, of course, there's nine churches in town. It's an interesting thing to measure a town by the kind of churches it has. They have a Catholic church, Lutheran church, three kinds of Methodist. You got ME South, Methodist Episcopal South. You got ME Zion, that's the African American church. And you've got a Methodist German church that apparently will continue to give services in German to World War I when it becomes problematic to do that anymore. <laughs> and we don't do that. We got Presbyterians, we got Episcopalians, and we got two kinds of Baptists. We got Anglo Baptist Church, and right up the street is the German Baptist Church. So you can have your Baptist services in German or you um, English. Some of the first ever tax-supported schools in Texas are in Brenham. Um, there actually is a black school that becomes quite famous and well-known after the turn of the century, but it's actually begun in the 1870s after the Constitution is adopted in 76. So we have a white school, a black school, open to men and women alike. We also have a private school for Germans, a Schulverein, opened up by a private group of Germans. And of course, as they pass on the baton, it'll be run by German Americans. And that Schulverein will actually survive well into the 20th century. What about newspapers? You actually have several newspapers. This is the most prominent. This is the Brenham Daily Banner. And this is Colonel John G. Rankin. That's an honorary title. As far as I can tell, he served less than a year, but he was a Confederate in Company E of the 5th Texas Cavalry. Ha ha ha, gotcha, didn't I? <laughs> he actually served under what's called Sibley's Brigade, 5th Regiment, Texas Mounted Volunteers. Um, his records only run through early 62, though. By the end of the war, he's home. He's partnered up. He's actually running a newspaper called the Southern Banner with a partner here in Brenham, and they were so loud and anti-federal that they're one of the buildings that got burned in 1866. So John G. Rankin retools, reinvests, and he is labeled on the newspaper as the editor, publisher, and proprietor of the Brenham Daily Banner in 1881. Colonel John G. Rankin, hardcore pro-Southern Confederate, and very gracious in his support of this meeting when it came to town. Um, colorful fellow. Colonel would be very much an honorary title. Um, elsewhere in town, 
better. Move this. We have, looking around, we have a Masonic Lodge. We have an Odd Fellows Lodge. We have a Knights of Pythias Lodge. We have a B'nai B'rith chapter. Told you there was a Jewish population here. We have a Germania Verein. We have the Harugari. Now, I'm not familiar with this organization. It's German, and it's apparently kind of a fraternal organization. There's the American Legion of Honor. That has nothing to do with the American Legion of today. Again, it was a self-help, service-oriented fraternity that when you joined, you paid in and got a life insurance policy that would help your children and your widow if something happened to you. There's also an organization called the Knights of Honor that has begun in Kentucky and spread down here. There is on the corner near the seven saloons in town a United Friends of Temperance chapel. Seven saloons. There are more saloons in Brenham than there are grocery stores. We'll get to that in a second. It's an inch. No wonder they want to have their reunion here, right? Bless their hearts. There are two militia companies in town. I loved this. They're both part of the Texas Volunteers, the volunteer guard of the time. There's the Brenham Grays, and they're all white. And there's the Brenham Blues, and they're all black. I love that. Of course, they would name themselves Blue and Gray. And there's actually, the Germans don't want to associate with anybody, so they have their own militia company, which they proudly list in the cards in the newspaper as unaffiliated. <laughs> they call it the Schutzenverein, which is a common term for shooting club, but it's a militia. They drill and all that. There was two Grange chapters, hus hus patrons of husbandry, but I didn't find a Farmer's Alliance chapter, but there must have been one around here. Most small Texas towns had one. You know, this is a booming operation. Um, the business district, well, let's kick back just a second. Business district, give you some idea. There's one historian um, who claims there were 150 businesses in Brenham in 1880. I didn't find that many cards or ads in the newspapers, but I did find this. Um, if you're wondering what you could buy in Brenham in 1881 for our intrepid travelers who are coming, there were 12 merchants of various types. Seven saloons, one of which doubled as a wagon yard. Four grocery stores, three drug stores, two tailors in case you want to really look good at the reunion, and a lumber yard. There's also a sign maker, a fellow who makes his living as a confectioner. And of course, there's a butcher. There's really a foundry. It'll work. It'll become a genuine iron yard after a while. Um, there's a shoemaker, a boot seller, a contractor, in case you want a new house built, and a painter who will show up and paint it for you. Only one restaurant, it's odd, but you could eat at any of the boarding houses and hotels, and there are three of those in town. Um, there are 10 lawyers, <laughs> of course, five doctors, I'm sure the lawyers are keeping their eye on them, two real estate agents, one of whom also ran a grocery store downstairs. You, you just never knew about the real estate market, right? Just, you have a backup plan three livery stables, and two of those double as undertakers. <laughs> so, somehow you didn't make it back from your night out, the guy that put up your horse would take care of other business for you. They would advertise coffins and even preparation services. Okay, uh, two insurance agencies. There were three banks, one run by Jefferson Bassett, one run by a German bank by... Inglecki, E-N-G-L-E-K-E, E-F-A, and then Giddings and Giddings, the famous Giddings brothers. We'll hear more about them. So it's a very diverse, exciting place. A lot of these guys that are coming for the meeting, they come from small farms and small places. They don't have seven saloons to choose from. <laughs> or the restaurants are three hotels in one town. Brenham is not, you know, the middle of nowhere for them. This is Bright Light's a big city in many ways to them. And change is coming to Brenham. Um, that volunteer fire department, they're a little ball of fire, not to use a pun intentionally, but they start taking over a lot of things that continue today. For example, in 1881 in Brenham, along with us, they held their first Mayfest. And that Mayfest is held every year since then. 
Now, there was a preceding Volksfest, but it was run by the Haragari Club. And it, it was a struggle to keep it up financially. So the Volunteer Fire Department took it over, and they're the ones that created Mayfest in 1881. The Volunteer Fire Department, also in 1881, hosted the first ever Washington County Fair, which continues till today. So Brenham, like I said, was an interesting place, a place that Things were happening. It had survived hard times. It had given a lot of its young men off to the war. And now they'll be coming home just right down the street to a reunion of Hood's Texas Brigade. That seemed like a good kicker right there. Nice picture. When did we come to town? June the 22nd, 1881. And the meeting was only for one day. But I do get the impression that a lot of them showed up early and stayed for a couple of days afterwards. You know, it's been a long time since a lot of them had seen each other, right? They want to visit. Um, this is number 10 reunion for Hood's Texas Brigade. They had organized in May of 1872. And in 1881, since there were a lot of Terry's Texas Ranger veterans around here, they invited them to join them in the reunion. Um, I don't find a lot of Terry's Texas names, though. They may have simply been quiet. They may have simply shown up for the banquet that evening. They didn't keep roll for that. The roll was kept for the reunion in the daytime business. So they may have been there. I just couldn't find them. They're invited. It's part of a national state movement of reunions. Um, also reuniting in the summer of 1881 in Texas was Ector's Texas Brigade. They held a reunion over at Rusk. Parsons Texas Brigade held a reunion over at Corsicana. And Ross's Texas Brigade held a reunion over at Sulphur Springs. So reunions have become quite a business. And it's part of the lost cause movement, yes, but I think it's also a part of personal identity. They want to make sure that their stories aren't lost and that people remember their contribution to what has happened. What I thought was fun was to kind of break down who's here. And I took that list you provided, and I slapped it up against the Galveston newspaper list and a couple others. And total, we think there were around 127 people here. And this is the way it breaks down. From the 1st Texas Infantry, 13. From the 4th Texas Infantry, 37. 5th Texas, don't put your head down, 59. They were number one. But think about it. Company E and I came from Washington County. This is a hometown reunion for them. 59 from the 5th Texas. Were there any from the 3rd Arkansas? Two. Anybody from the 18th Georgia? One. Might have been a fraud, but we're not sure. Yeah. <laughs> that guy, remember him, the, the Rockdale? Yeah, yeah, he became VP later on. Um, one from the 18th Georgia and one from Hampton's Legion. That leaves nine. Now we'll talk about the six honorary in a second, but of the others, there are four Confederate veterans who came over from Chapel Hill, three of them from Alabama one from an unidentified battery of artillery, and one fellow who's identified only as historian. And I don't know who he was. I mean, I got his name. He's on your list. And I'm not sure what historian means, but that was his identification. Maybe he was just a history guy. You know, maybe time traveled and went back and visited with him. Um, it's kind of a local affair, as I said, of the attendees, excuse me, 124, 42 came from Washington County. 42 had served in Company E, which is, of course, the uh, Dixie Blues of Washington, Captain John D. Rogers, who was not here. and Or they had served in Company I, which, of course, was the Texas AIDS, organized by Captain Jerome B. Robertson. They came from Independence. Out of those 42, 28 still lived here. They hadn't gone far in the 15, 16 years since the war. So if you actually tally it up, and when you say, Rick, you, you said a local affair, out of 124 present, um, over 25% lived in Washington County. And I took a look at some of the other reunions real quick. That seems to have been the way it was. They didn't travel too far. 
There was not a single person here who didn't live in Texas. That includes the Arkansas guys, that includes the Hamptons Legion fellow, and the 18th Georgia. They're all Texas residents. There's nobody who came from outside of Texas. So, what are our honorary members? Well, they're an interesting crew. These are guys that they must have known during the war or knew about during the war. They sent an invitation, and by golly, they showed up. First is Thomas J. Gorey, who by that time is the director of the Texas State Penitentiary. But he had served on Longstreet's staff during the war, and his brother served in the 5th Texas Infantry. So he's got his brother there with him. He hasn't come far. It's Huntsville. And think about it. Hood's Texas Brigade was in Longstreet's Corps. They may have known the older Gorey brother, Thomas Jefferson Gorey, back in the war. There was also Francis Richard Lubbock, who, <laughs> interesting guy. Um, you would have loved the talk on Wednesday night. It was Lubbock and Jeff Davis and Reagan fleeing from Richmond. I did that one. Yes, I forgot. Yeah. Well, he's now state treasurer, so of course you invite the money guy. Um, but more importantly to them, he'd been the Confederate governor of Texas, then he gave up. He did not run for re-election. Headed off to Richmond and became a part of Jefferson Davis's staff. His brother, by the way, had been Colonel Thomas Tom, had been Colonel of the Terry's Texas Rangers and was killed in the war. So maybe he's a Terry's Texas Ranger by extension. Um, who's this other guy I've got here? Charles C. Chaplin, Doctor of Divinity. Well, he was the pastor of the local Anglo Baptist Church. And he had composed a poem about Hood's Texas Brigade. And they liked it so much they had him read it twice. And then he gave toasts at the banquet afterwards. So they added him to the honorary list after the meeting started because they liked him so much and they liked his poem. And if you're looking around, Martha, yeah, I've got the poem. And if you want me to read it, I will in a bit. It's not a good poem, but it's a poem. Oh, no, the stanzas are only four lines. I can read it fast. We'll, I'll put it at the end. It, it's, it fits there very nicely. Um, another fellow that they invited was a fellow named James T. Whitesides. Now, Whitesides never served in Hood's Texas Brigade, but his son, Asa H. Whitesides, did. Now, the elder Whitesides had fought in the Republic of Texas Army. His son was captured at Gettysburg while serving with Hood's Texas Brigade. He was taken to Pea Island, Fort Delaware, as a prisoner and decided to try to escape. And if you know anything about that place, you had to swim. Well, he drowned. His son had drowned while trying to escape from Fort Delaware during the war. And so they had honorary made this guy an honorary inv invitation. Um, who are the others? Well, there's two more, like I said, and that's Bassett, the banker, and another businessman, and I kind of think they were invited for local arrangements they had made. I think they were helping out with the, the reunion. Um, part of that, which I was, thought was very interesting, was J.H. Blake and Company of Houston donated a bale of cotton for the support of the reunion. And it was sold for $2,500 by bid. And then the money, of course, was rolled into holding the reunion. Well, that was sweet of them, right? $2,500 for a bale of cotton in 1881 was a pretty good price. Um, so the chaplain is there. That's Charles C. Chaplin. We've got two former Confederates. We've got a father who lost his boy when he was serving with the State Brigade. And the two guys who had helped stage the reunion. All proceedings, oh, these are some of our Washington County boys, some very familiar pictures, Jerome Robertson, um, the Felders of Chapel Hill, and John H. Roberts of Independence. Then we have the fact that they brought their fourth Texas flag with them and hung it over the stage. So everybody who spoke, like I'm speaking now, this flag would be hanging right there. There's a modern color picture. Um, it allegedly had 65 or 68 bullet holes in it. 
Um, that's why I included the picture with the drawing from Chaplain Davis. He had marked where all the bullet holes were. And lest you think this thing wasn't something they had in their possession, this is a picture of him at a later reunion holding the flag out in front of their meeting place. So they also had a brass band. They got Germans in town. Of course they got a brass band, right? That played Dixie pretty much at every break. Um, so who spoke? What were they talking about? Well, the welcome, which is kind of one of the big speeches of the day, was given by DeWitt C. Giddings. He had been lieutenant colonel of the 21st Texas Cavalry in the war. Come home, he and his brother had become very successful businessmen and had established one of the oldest banks in town. What did Giddings talk about? He talked about reconciliation. Now, the whole theme, of course, you talked first about the wonderful achievements of Hutch Texas Brigade. You would recount every battle and talk about how well they did. Even if the battle wasn't a particularly winning engagement, it didn't matter. Hood's Texas Brigade had glorious achievements. But I was fascinated with his theme is, but guys, you know as well as I do now, we need peace. We need to bring our land back together. And he ended up his speech with a poem an excerpt from a poem very familiar to many of us, I think. I'm going to read it very quickly. On fame's eternal camping ground, their silent tents are spread, and glory guards with solemn sound the bivouac of the dead. You've seen that on lots of national cemeteries. It's carved over the gates, the main McClellan Gate to Arlington National Cemetery. Um, the reason why I wanted to bring that up is to link into something Martha said. They are now taking down the Confederate monument at Arlington. They don't even know that this is carved over their main gate, written by a Confederate officer from Kentucky named Theodore O'Hara. And I'm not going to tell them. That's what I'm waiting to see. Will they tell you that down? But yeah, Bivouac of the Dead was written by Theodore O'Hara, a Kentucky Confederate officer. Now, you've had your welcome, so you have your thank you speech. Love this set of images. This is John N. Henderson, who by this time is a successful judge up in Dallas. He's the 5th Texas Company. He lost that arm at Antietam in the fighting at Sharpsburg. Again, a long talk on the accomplishments of Hush Texas Brigade, but also focusing on their earnest desire for peace and reconciliation. And he had the band strike up Dixie again as he walked off stage. It's a great set of images. This is also online, and I've used it several times. Then the big keynote speech, Thomas N. Wall, which I was fascinated that you talked about his monument being destroyed. Um, interesting character, had created his own legion at the beginning of the war that morphed into more of a cavalry regiment. And boy, he's a, he's a pistol. He talks about reconciliation a little bit. He will speak more passionately about the record of the Hoods Texas Brigade. And the reason I put this other image, this is Wall wearing his Confederate uniform in 1891. I mean, this is the guy that's going to end up his talk with a de declaration that his fellow Texans residents of the best place on earth should continue to stand against anything that was unjust or unlawful. So reconciliation, yeah, but no. If the, if the time is right, I got the old uniform in the closet. We're going to go kick some Yankee butt, you know. And, of course, he got a wild ovation because, yes, they want peace and reconciliation, but, you know, he's not asking them to apologize. And I thought it was really fun to see that different approach you know, getting, and then all of a sudden Wall getting up there and stirring the flames a little bit. And they enjoyed it, you know. They, then it's time to get down to business. They reelect their officers. And that's essentially what they're doing here. Jerome B. Robertson, of course, who had gone on to be the general of the brigade at one point, began over here at Independence. He's president. Clinton M. Winkler is going to be vice president. Uh, also, 
high-ranking colonel and commander of the brigade at one point. And then who's Robert Burns? He's another 5th Texan. He was major of the 5th Texas. He's a businessman now over in Houston in the cotton brokerage business, actually working with one of the Lubbocks. He's in his house over there. And um, what is interesting about this slate is these are all 5th Texas. 5th Texas is moving in and kind of becoming the leadership, at least at this reunion and for the next few years. You know, of all the regiments, that's the one. Then they get down to the committee reports. Jerome B. Robertson reports on behalf of history. They are talking about putting a book together. And they've got a contract with a guy named Castle. And what they did is compile some documents. And they paid him $75 to sell, to print up a bunch of copies of these compiled documents, which they will sell to members and anybody else who wants them for 25 cents a pop. Um, I've seen some of these come up for auction. Basically, they're just a staple print sort of thing. It's not a very elaborate piece at all. Um, the problem is they're having trouble getting documents. Uh, people are sending in things that they can't read. The, the handwriting is illegible. You know, the stuff has been damaged through the years. So they're kind of complaining about that, that it's hard to find materials if we're going to do a real book. It's hard to find a compiler. Well, we know who's going to step forward, and he's active in the committee and pushing for a lot of this stuff, and that's Joe B. Polly. And some of you will ask, well, where's Frank Chilton in all this? Frank's not there. His wife died. First week of June, 1881. Followed nine days later by their three-week-old newborn second daughter. So Frank has lost an infant daughter and his wife all in the week just before this reunion. So he's not there. Now, he and Polly will butt heads later, but Frank's distracted. By the way, it's not going to get any better for Frank in this decade. He's going to marry another young lady. She's going to die two years later, leaving Frank alone to raise two young daughters. Um, he'll work it out, and he will be front and center. You know how much we use his materials today, but, you know, he's not here. And the book project is really going to flounder, perhaps because we don't have that dynamic between Polly and Chilton, because I think a lot of what got done is just because they're trying to push past the other. Now, we've got descendants of Polly here. Do we? Yeah. Right. Okay, hey, Polly people? Well, oh, there you are. I didn't see you over there. I know the Tyners. Hello. I'm the official guardian for the SCD for Frank Chilton's great in Texas. Well, good job. Somebody. You know, all this stuff, we need our preservationists. We need their guardians. Next topic was, what are we going to do to contribute to the Hutch Orphan Foundation? Um, they had been gathering money, and Joseph Nagel was kind of the treasurer, un informal treasurer. He's a first Texas veteran, and he reports they have $1,300.39. Now, what they're doing, why the orphans? Well, of course, Hood himself, his wife, and his eldest daughter had died of yellow fever in New Orleans, leaving 10 children. And I think very smartly they decided instead of putting up a big monument, like a big obelisk or something, why don't we make the children his living monuments? Let's see to take care of them. Let's feed them. Let's see that they get to schools. If they want to go to college, we, the veterans of the Confederate States of America, will take care of that. And so they've raised 1339 $1,300.39. Why do I have Robert Burns' picture? Because he proposed that they take this money and sink it into good, stable state bonds. And state treasurer Francis R. Lubbock stood up and said, that is not a good idea because they're not producing very much. You might want to find a better investment. So Lubbock and Burns agreed to work together to find a better investment than our own dang state bonds. That's kind of a Who's monitoring the bond? Oh, yeah, Francis. We are a very conservative government. We don't do a lot of crazy investing. So Lubbock told him the interest rate was too low. He could do better on the private market, and they moved on. What's next? Well, they also had agreed to pay Henry McArdle for the painting called Lee in the Wilderness. They'd agreed to pay him $1,000 for it. 
So far, they'd raised 150 bucks. <laughs> We're not making much progress here. So they sat around talking a little bit about that, agreed to continue trying to raise money, but what's going to happen in November? Anybody remember? Yep. The picture will be loaned by McArdle to the Texas legislature. It will be proudly hanging in the Capitol when it burns to the ground, completely destroying the picture in November. So it kind of lets Hoods Texas Brigade off the hook, doesn't it? So it's kind of a moot point. That's why the picture here is a black and white photograph, because we don't have the original. McArdle will make another one, which I understand is the hands of a private Dallas collector these days. Yeah. Slightly smaller, slightly different, but it still survives. You, I'm sure you could, Martha. <laughs> okay, so now they've gone through all their business. They sing Dixie again. And they get ready for their banquet, which went well into the evening. And it was the theme was, of course, reconciliation and handshake. They even had a union veteran, Major Puckett, there give a few toasts. You know, somebody had to represent. He was invited to sit. They did, during the reunion, by the way, invite union veterans to come sit with them. I don't have any names if they actually did that. But they were certainly there at the banquet. A long series of toasts. Um, there was a Terry's Texas Ranger there named John M. Claiborne, a very prominent and colorful fellow. Bit of a solemn note, though, because they had to take note of how many were not there. And the only reason I put this picture up here is to show that these fellows are aging. They're aging rapidly. Time is flying. It's, it's, it's becoming their enemy. You know, this is Willis Worth. He and two of his brothers were there. There's Val Giles, a picture of him in the famous picture we always know and probably more what he looked like at the time of the reunion. And then, of course, Lawrence Daffin, a prominent member of the 4th Texas. Um, 13 of them have died since the last reunion. They go down the list and note that 13 had died. It's the last time many of them will attend. Some examples that I ran across. Robert Park died before the end of June from an illness. He went home and was dead by June 29th. Um, L. Spring, who was a Hungarian member, of the, died in a hotel fire at Washington on the Brazos in September of 1881. And as you well know, another thing that will delay some of the history and some of the projects is Winkler died before the next reunion. He'll die in May of 1882 on the eve. So to round this all up, the point is they had a wonderful time. They had a great time. Brennan was a good selection of a spot. You know, you might have thought, why didn't they meet in Houston or Dallas? Brenham had everything they needed as a place that gave them great attention, and it was really the home base for a large chunk of them that could easily arrive at the reunion. Why did they do it? Because other groups are doing it, and they shared the idea of not losing their identity, not having their story forgotten. But also, in their moves to write a book, monuments were discussed, to contribute to national movements like Hood's Texas Brigade, contribution to the, the Hood's orphans, to make sure that their name was not only remembered, but remembered in a place of prominence. And that's what these reunions were all about. They enjoyed seeing each other. It was great to talk and catch up and, you know, how the kids and all that kind of stuff. But there was serious business done at these reunions during the time that they survived. And that's why we see these badges and all these mementos and books and publications. It was part of something that they wanted to contribute to American history. They did not want that to be forgotten. Okay, this is Charles C. Chaplin, Doctor of Divinity, Hood's Texas Brigade. Of all who fought neath Southern Cross, none better record ever made, nor ever suffered greater loss than did the men of Hood's Brigade. At Freedom's Cry they left their all and flew to old Virginia's aid, where pressing forward at her call, West Point was stormed by Hood's brigade. At Seven Pines, the Texas yell was heard through tangled brake and glade, till among them many heroes fell. Victors at length stood Hood's brigade. At Gaines Mill and Cole Harbor, too, with helpless Richmond nigh dismayed, there routed were the boys in blue by those who fought 
in Hood's brigade. At White Oak Swamp was battle joined, and blow for blow was quickly paid. Fame's medals there were freshly coined and proudly won by Hood's brigade. On Malvern Hill, old Stonewall by, with Jeb Stuart ready for a raid, again the blue cloaks had to fly. The game was flushed by Hood's brigade. You getting the idea why they love this? Yeah. He did a good job for them. From Hazel Run through Thoroughfare Gap to where Bull Run's water strayed, at Boonesboro hit McClellan a trap to Sharp's Heights. Sharpsburg's Heights swept Hood's brigade. Twas at the far famed wilderness there Grant his forces all displayed. Some Southron fled the battle's press, but these were none of Hood's brigade. Bold Lee came flaming to the front, as well McCardle has portrayed, but my soldiers led him from the brunt. Lee to the rear, cried Hood's brigade. At Darbyton they were well met, and the blue coats with them roughly played. They laughed and shouted, Texas get. Yes, we get, you bet, said Hood's brigade. Apparently they all laughed at that. They liked that. At Gettysburg were shot and shell, with grape knife formed a shade, as though lured on by the marriage bell, upward swept bold Hood's brigade. At Chancellor's, where Jackson's arm forever sheathed its trenchant blade, as whirlwind strong without alarm, to victory rushed this Hood's brigade. Uh, parenthetically, they weren't at Chancellorsville. So. I'm sure they're all a little quizzical. At Appomattox's bloody field, where fate most sadly was obeyed, Without dishonor's taint did yield the remnant left of Hood's brigade. On thirty fields these heroes fought, and never will their laurels fade, for true renown is ever bought by deeds like those of Hood's brigade. But now this cruel world is war is over, with all its danger and parade. May sweet peace reign forevermore, pray all the men of Hood's brigade. War had along with shadows drear, its lights in which was humor rayed. Many a loud and ringing cheer betokened fun in Hood's brigade. Twas Christus time, the war was hot. Of home thought men of every grade, and sadly sighed at their hard lot. No Christmas time had Hood's brigade. The papers spoke of sumptuous feast, turkeys, chickens by cooks arrayed, cakes, pies, and things from south and east to feed to the full Hood's brigade. But when it came... Twas feast so small, though sent by men of every trade. Let Richmond's poor now have it all. We'll do without it, said Hood's brigade. But here you have a table spread. And now he's back to 8081 with them. Here you have a table spread with cakes and wines and lemonade. Of turkeys, hams, be there no dread, but spirits float around Hood's brigade. Spirits, by the way, is in quotation marks. <laughs> but ah, time thins your much-loved ranks. The boys of yore are maimed or grayed. Still are you full of merry pranks, for death alone stills Hood's brigade. A toast, a toast, come bow your head. Use water which your God has made. He's a Baptist, remember. I drink now to the honored dead who grandly died in Hood's brigade. <laughs>